All right, it's going to be a good night. You stay standing for just one more moment. So I get the absolute honor of introducing our guest speaker tonight. Yes. We don't want this ministry to be based off the personality of one, but the voices of many. Uh, it's so important for us to have different people, different perspectives, different background that come and preach the word of God. Because uh, every person speaks the word of God differently and speaks to different people differently. So it's so important for us to have many voices up here on the stage. But this person is uh, particularly very special to the young adult ministry. Uh, this person, she came to us about almost three years ago. And she was a summer intern for young adults. And then she jumped into our nine-month internship program. Free of charge, she did not make a single penny except maybe some Chick-fil-A and some pizza. Um, but she worked for free for nine months, couldn't go to school, couldn't work another job, worked for free for nine months. And then she became a resident for an entire year, pay, got paid minimum wage to work another year in pursuit of the call that God had in her life. But the powerful thing about her story is that a lot of people in her life were like, I don't know if you're supposed to be doing ministry. I don't know if this is the thing for you. But she felt so deeply the call of God on her life and took a step of faith. And she's an amazing part of this community now. She's an absolute powerhouse. She runs all of our productions, so all the lights, all the things you see, she runs all of that. She runs all of our social media. Uh, she runs the podcast, uh, all of the creative stuff, all the things that you see that are, is forward focusing in our ministry. She is the creator behind everything. Uh, so she's absolutely amazing. So I believe that she has a powerful and anointed word. So, young adults, can you please give it up for the one and only Milana Bakken? Come on, everybody. Come on. Come on. longer. Um, my name is Milana. Uh, <laughs> I have the absolute honor of being at this team at Young Adults. Um, like he said, I do the production, so you know I have to, have to shout out my amazing production team back in the booth. Yeah, give it up for them. You guys, they they make me look like I'm really good at my job. Like, they're, they're incredible. I love you guys. Crush it. Um, and so there's more honor due tonight. Um, Could you guys just like Man, Connor, Matrone, like you guys have no idea how freaking lucky we are to have the pastors that we do leading young adults. Like these guys, yeah, like you, man, they're like the real deal, like on the stage, off the stage. I am so fortunate to work with them. They're like family to me. You guys are like my big brothers. They like make fun of me and tease me, but it's fine, you know. <laughs> we forgive them. They're like a bunch of bros and only girl on the team, but I feel nothing but like, yeah, empowered and believed in. Like they do such a good job of like supporting like women in ministry. I remember being in this room a few years ago and feeling like this tug on my heart. I'm like, God, I feel like you're like calling me into this. Like, I don't know, like I feel like you're calling me to this place, to this house of YA, but I'm not sure. And about three and a half years ago, Zachary Atwood <laughs> stood on this stage and was preaching a sermon and sort of took like a little sidebar and was like, hey, if you're a woman in here and you're like thinking about ministry or you like feel like you might have a call into ministry, like do it, like you're so welcome. And that was like the final thing that was like, okay, God, like that was like the confirmation I needed. And so fast forward, intern, and now I'm on this team. And I absolutely love young adults. Like, I love young adult ministry. I believe in this generation so much. Like, I think it's so important what we get to do here. And I remember, I feel that way because I was actually saved at a young adult ministry myself out in Oklahoma while I was at school. I was, like, lost and hurting and totally had no idea what direction I was going in life. And a friend invited me to, like, a college ministry on campus. And Jesus changed my life. And it was amazing. And I, I remember moving, <laughs> yes, uh, I remember moving back to Colorado and being like, okay, like I, I want to like have the same sort of community. Like I really don't want to go all summer break without like having this sort of connection and this community. And so I like go and I Google like college ministry in Denver. 
And Young Adults pops up, and I'm like, okay, all right, they meet Thursday nights. And you guys, it's like, it's so embarrassing. I email them. I think we have a picture. It's like, st- <laughs> I email, and I'm like, hey, um, I, we're wanting to come. Do we need to, like, register, sign up? This is, like, pre-COVID. I'm like, can I bring any snacks? Like, thinking it's a Bible study, and I show up, and there's, like, hundreds of young adults, and I'm like, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> like, never let them find out that it was me. Um, but I remember being in this room, and it being my first time, and being, like, really nervous, and seeing the crowds of people and being like, what is going on? What is this place? Um, so if it's your first time, actually, would you raise your hand? I know I saw a few of you. Some, yes, welcome. Welcome. We're so, so glad you're here. I remember being in your position. And let me just say, like, we're so excited that you're joining us. We want you to know that, like, you don't have to have all the answers coming in here. Like, you don't have to necessarily even believe what we believe or show up in the nice church clothes. Like, you're, we're just glad you're here. And we, like, we would love to meet you, learn your story after service. Um, With that being said, though, tonight is going to unapologetically and unashamedly be about Jesus Christ. We, man, we think he is just the most, we believe he's the most amazing person to ever walk this earth. We believe that he is the hope for humanity. And our prayer tonight is that however you walked into here tonight, that you would leave here with an encounter with Jesus of some sort. That is our prayer. That is our hope. We have been in this series of people of God, and it's been totally amazing. So much fun. Anybody else, like, really love this series so far? So good. So stinking good. Connor gave us a message the first week about how we are a people set apart. Like, God wants a people set apart for himself, for his purpose. And then Matron gave a message last week about community, how about we're supposed to be set apart in community with each other, with other believers, doing life with people who share the same values as us. And I've loved talking, I've loved this series, I've loved talking about God's people and seeing how we can look at scripture and from the very beginning always see that God's plan from the start was always his people, right? Like we see that from the very beginning with Adam and Eve and all throughout scripture and up until today. And man, God loved, like God loves his people. So I've just enjoyed this series. Like God loves you. God loves me. God even loves Zach. Like, man, we, because we are his people and we are his plan A. So tonight, I want to talk about how as his people, as his people set apart, his people set apart in community, how we're supposed to look in contrast with the culture of our world, with the world surrounding us, right? Like we live in a society where culture is moving at like light speed, right? Like it's constantly changing one day to the next, like moving on to like what's important, now this or that, what culture or society is telling that we need to like fulfill us, right? Like it's constantly progressing in so many different directions, so many different ways. And I wanna talk about this tonight by looking at this idea in scripture, this theme of the remnant. The remnant. Um, The definition of the word remnant is a small remaining quantity of something, what remains of an original body or substance. And in scripture, we see it uh, used as this word shirith. And it basically, it's used as it means what is left. And within the Bible, this word is often referring to the group of God's people that remain like after a catastrophe, like a flood or a war or a famine, a plague. And we see this idea all throughout scripture. Like we see it in many different stories, this idea of the remnant. And one place we see this sort of play out is in the book of Judges. So if you have your Bible tonight, we're going to be in Judges chapter 2. Brief disclaimer, if you've read Judges before, if like you're in here and you're familiar and you're like, that's really violent, like that's a really epic tale, we'll get there, (laughs) we'll get there. So um, Judges, starting in chapter 2, it's now the angel of the Lord went up from Gigal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words, all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and left and wept. They called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. 
And when Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel each went to his inheritance to take possession of the land, the promised land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at an age of 110 years, and they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnatheres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash, and all that generation were also gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. The title of my message tonight, if you're taking notes, is A Remnant of Remembrance. A Remnant of Remembrance. Let, us, let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you so much that your spirit is in this room. God, I thank you so much for every single person that you brought in tonight, Lord. I believe that there's a specific thing that you've put on each person's heart that you want to speak to them about, that you want you want to talk to them about, that you want to bring up in their lives, Jesus. And I believe, man, that you, by your power tonight, we will, we will get to interact with you. We will get to see you move, God. So we are just asking that you are so honored with tonight, Jesus. We ask that you be with us, set your spirit to move in our hearts. And all the people at YA said, amen, amen. amen. Has anybody ever, like, forgotten something that they, like, know that they know that they know they thought they'd, like, never, ever forget? Anybody, like, anybody have a terrible memory? Connor? Connor has the worst memory in the world. <laughs> we'll, like, have a conversation, and a week later, he's like, what? What are you talking about? That didn't happen. Um, and my husband, Jake, my husband, I, he told me I had to show a picture of him tonight. So there's my husband. We got married in October. <laughs> Um, Jake experiences this all the time, and I know this because I know that he knows that his socks and his hats, like, don't go on the floor of the living room or, like, the kitchen counter. Like, I know that he knows that, like, his socks or his hats don't belong on the TV entertainment center, right? Like, I'm sure he knows. Like, I'm sure he knows that his... His dirty clothes go in the hamper and, like, not in the, on the floor next to the hamper. Like, he knows, right? He just, he just forgets sometimes, you know? Like, you know what I'm talking about? You're like, oh, man, how could I forget that? Like, I do this a million times. I, I experienced this in my teenage years. Um, I was a competitive volleyball player. I played club. I traveled. Yeah, any volleyball players in the house? Yes. <laughs> Josh, yeah, right. No, anybody, like, really good at volleyball? Like, you're, like, good. No, I'm, talk I'm not talking, like, backyard volleyball, barbecue. No, I'm talking, like, six on six, indoor, knee pads, ankle braces. Yeah, the whole shebang. The whole shebang. I love it. Keisha and I are always, like, be like, I'm really good. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll decide. <laughs> no, but I played competitive volleyball, and that was, like, all I did. Like, that was all I knew. I, I had practices almost every night of the week, optional practices on Friday where you, like, you actually had to be there, Saturday morning practices, and then like all day tournaments on Sunday. Like it was all I knew in high school. And my husband, he's like really well-rounded, you know, he like sings, he's musical, he plays instruments, you know, skills that are like really useful in your adult life. And all I have to show for my seven years of volleyball is like really bad knees and a shoulder that hurts all the time, but it's fine. <laughs> But I remember a specific game, a specific tournament. We were at a national qualifier in Denver, Colorado called Crossroads. And my team and I, we really, really wanted to do well at this tournament because if we did, we got a bid to something called JOs, which was Junior Olympics. And everybody wanted to go to Junior Olympics. So it's like a three-day tournament, and you, like, absolutely have to do good on the first day in order to, like, break up into, like, the winner's circle. And if not, you, like, go to the loser's circle, and you have no chance at JOs. So remember, it's our first day, and it's our last match of the night, and it's like they had won the first set. We're, like, losing, and we're, like, this is our only hope. Like, we have to win this match in order to even get a chance at Junior Olympics. And we're in the second set, and it's, like, 22 to 24, right? And in volleyball, you have to win by two, you know, and you have first to 25. Those are, like, the rules. <laughs> um, and I'm, like, a kind of competitive person in the sense that, like, I absolutely could not stand losing. And I'm, like, competitive to the point where, like, even though I wasn't, like, I was the short girl, like, the libero in the back row with a different colored jersey. I wasn't, like, the one, the t <laughs> yeah, I wasn't the tall girl up at the net, like, getting kills. Like, I didn't get to score points. But because I'm moderately competitive, I, like, made sure in this sport that I played, I'm like, I'm going to find a way. Like, I'm going to find a way for me to, like, be able to score points. 
So whenever I would serve, like, I, I was going for blood. Like, I'm like, you're going to shank this ball, like, to the other side of the room. I would practice my serve all the time to make sure that I had, like, one of the best serving percentages on my team. And because I'm, like, extremely, extremely competitive. So we're in this last match, and we need, like, we're in a timeout. My coach is like, okay, we need one side out. We need to get the ball back. And then Milan is serving. And then, like, we can control the game from there, and we'll be good. And my team's like, yeah, like, let's do it. Like, we got this. So we get the side out, and everybody's like, yes, we're going. Like, we're going to get to go to JOs. Like, we're not taking out. Like, Milana, you got this. So I go back to the serving line. My team's like, yeah. And serving in volleyball is kind of like shooting a free throw in basketball. Like you're back there all by yourself, like tons of pressure, everybody watching you. So, you know, it's like basketball. You have like your little routine that you do to like calm your nerves. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to bounce the ball twice with both my hands and then once with my right hand and then I'm ready to go. And I, I get ready and I'm like, this is, this is it. I go up. I serve this ball. This ball goes flying light speed into the bottom of the net. Oh, you guys, I, like, couldn't believe it. I just stood there, and I was like, what? I was like, surely that did not just happen. Like, there is no way. Like, I have seen this play out hundreds of times. Like, I've seen that perfect serve. Like, I have the muscle memory. Like, I, surely I know how to serve over the net. That's, like, the one rule. Like, get it over, you know? <laughs> and I remember just standing there, and I'm like, how could that possibly have happened? Like, there's no way. We lose the game. Like, how could I forget Something that I know that I know that I know. Anyone else ever been there? Like you just, you just are like, what just happened? This is like the sort of thing that we see play out in the book of Judges, okay? Um, sort of a backstory. So Judges picks up um, with God's people, the Israelites, finally getting to the promised land. So this is like after Moses has led them out of Egypt, after the Exodus, after God has delivered them from slavery, after he leads them through the wilderness and provides food. Um, This is after Moses has died and Joshua steps in and he's their leader. And so this, this story, this book of Judges picks up with the Israelites in the promised land, Joshua dying and giving the land over to the Israelites. But something that we see in this story is that God does not eliminate all of their enemies, right? Like, God allows for the Can- they're living amongst the Canaanites. And the Israels are they're in the Israelites are in the promised land living amongst the Canaanites. And this book is called Judges because at this time Israel didn't have any kings to rule over them. And so God, he would raise up these leaders called judges to help them rule over the Canaanites. And the whole purpose of them wanting to rule over the Canaanites was because the Canaanites were morally corrupt. They were sinful, evil. They were partaking in like false idols, false gods, and they wanted to avoid their moral corruption and the sin surrounding them. And if you have read the book of Judges, you know it's like this epic tale of war and battles, and it basically just tells of the moral failure of all these judges and of all the Israelites and how instead of these judges rising up and remembering the commandments and the characteristics of the Lord, they, they end up becoming almost exactly like the Canaanites. And this whole book is like this cycle of error of like God would raise up a judge and they would deliver Israel and then they would sin and then Israel would repent and then God would raise up another judge and then they would sin and so forth and so forth. And this happens over and over and over. We see it with Athenial, Ehud, Deborah, Gideon. Over and over we see that God's people fail to remember who they are and what they know to be true and right So much so that by the end of the book, you can't even tell the difference between the Israelites, God's chosen people, and the Canaanites. So much so that they start treating the God, their God, like the gods of the Canaanites, and offering like child sacrifice and partaking in murder and moral corruption, sexual promiscuity. And they're they're completely lost with no direction, no one to rule over them, and God hadn't driven out all the Canaanites, so they're surrounded by all of this sin, all of the, these people influencing them around them, and like, why? why? Why would God not just drive them out? Like, why would God allow the Israelites to live amongst a people who were morally corrupt? And you also see that God would actually help raise up these judges, even though they were morally corrupt. Like, you see all throughout Scripture that God would empower them. All throughout Judges, it says that God's spirit is like with these leaders. Judges 
four, chapter 14 talking about Samson, who was one of the, the worst judges, um, <laughs> very like arrogant, prideful, promiscuous. And we see it says in verse 19 that the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Why? Like, why would God empower these morally corrupt people, these people who were so far from what he had originally intended for his people? Young adults, we see in this story by God using these broken people that God is absolutely committed to saving his people. That his plan from the very beginning was always his people. That he wants to accomplish his will, his desire, through his chosen people, right? So this was his plan. No matter how much the Israelites screwed up, he still wanted to use them. He still wanted to use them to deliver his people from the evil around them. We see a God who is faithful to his people, even though we see a people who completely succumbs to the culture around them and does not even remember their own God. We see a culture that is like going crazy around them and them just completely adopting the truths of what is surrounding them. Young adults, we still see this today. We live in a world where culture is like constantly changing, you know, like we live in a world where it's like, look at this, pay attention to this, worship this, you need this to be happy, this will fulfill you, now you need this, right, like find your truth in this, you know, it's constantly changing what the culture, what the world is telling us that we need for human flourishing. We live in a culture with many different truths, right, we live in a culture where it's like, oh, well, that's, that may be true for you, but that's, that's not my truth. Right? We live in a world that is moving at light speed, chasing after things like money, fame, success. We live in a world that puts grave importance on being up to date on the latest and greatest. We live in a culture that is practically screaming at us, like how could we possibly keep up with how fast culture and the world around us is changing? And we just came out of the year 2020. <laughs> where disaster seemed to strike and the world was completely flipped on its head. We saw like a, a worldwide pandemic. We saw political divide like never before. We saw racial tension that brought up more division than we have ever seen in our adult lives. We saw massive spikes in alcohol use, drug use, pornography use. We saw a giant spike in more and more people who were struggling with mental health issues, right? More and more people who were feeling lonely, anxious, depressed, Last year, we saw a catastrophe like never before cover our world. And we saw more and more people give way to the culture surrounding them. Barna recently did a study on the state of the church after 2020 that it reported that one in three practicing Christians no longer attend church after the COVID-19 crisis. One in three, one in three people who knows Jesus, who has been a part of a church family, who has been a part of that community, just stop going. This study also reported that there were serious signs of decline and hope amongst Christians. It said that the amount of practicing Christians within America is now a much smaller segment of an entire population, and it has been consistently declining since the year 2000 and saw a deeper decline after 2020. This is the state of the church, YA. This is the state of the church after a year like 2020, after a year of chaos and catastrophe, a year of pain and long suffering, where we could hardly keep up with what was going on in the world, with what was going on in culture. I'd never seen anything like it before. Like one day, the, every day it seemed like there'd be some new thing that like the world was like screaming at us. Like it had just been in our faces like never before, rapidly changing. And here we are left with a remnant of the church, a small remaining quantity of what was before, a remnant of people set apart for God, living amongst a culture that has run rampant for the last year and a half, 
a culture that is rapidly running in the opposite direction of God's will for his people, a culture that's saying, you need more of this, do whatever you want, live your own truth, sleep around, like find fulfillment in this, idolize fame, money, success, like you need more, more, more in order to be happy. You need more and more in order to fulfill you. But I believe, YA, that there is a remains, a remnant of God's church set apart for such a time as this. Why, if you're in this room, you are a part of that. Like, you are a part of his remnant. You can set apart in community with one another to pursue God's grace, to pursue, help bring about his will on earth. Romans 11.5 says, So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Why can I encourage you? Can I tell you that you have been graced for such a time as this? Like God has graced you that the aftermath of the disaster that our culture is creating, that you are here set apart, the remnant, the remains of his people here to rule over the earth. First Peter 2 and 9 says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are chosen young adult. You are royal. You are God's special possession. You are his plan A for this world. Like hear that if you hear anything tonight. You are his plan A to remember who he is and declare the praises of a God who brought you out of darkness into his light. We are the remnant young adults chosen by grace to stand on a foundation of who God has been time and time again in the face of a world that is rushing, that is constantly rushing after new truth. We stand in remembrance of the ultimate truth of who God is and who he will continue to be. Psalm 77 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O oh God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? Why God does not want a people that looks exactly like the rest of the world. God does not want a people that looks exactly like the culture around him. He wants a people that will be set apart, wants a people that will remember who he is, what he has done for them, and what he tells us is truth and brings about life. Young adults, being a people of remembrance, being a people who remember and a people who stand in remembrance is not just about recalling something that you know. Biblical remembrance is an unwavering trust in what you know to be true that is backed up by action. Why we're called to be a people of remembrance that will live out God's plan for this world, that will live out God's plan for this broken and hurting world. It's us, it's his people. We see that from Genesis all throughout Judges, all the way up until now, that no matter how much we might fail, no matter how much we might be wrong and adopt what we see around us, God still wants to use his people. If you go back and you, you read the rest of Judges and you see the stories of those leaders, you see that every single one of them failed. In one way or another, every single one of them failed, which isn't surprising. They were, they were human. They gave in into what was around them, what they were seeing, what people around them were partaking in. They're human. None of them could be perfect enough, righteous enough, sinless enough to rule on their own. The book of Judges ends in chapter 21, verse 25, and it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what they thought was right in their own eyes. His people were lost. They had no king. They had no one to look to for guidance, yet they needed that because they needed to be delivered from the sin and the evil and the hurting culture around them. They needed someone to rule. Fast forward thousands of years later when God sends his one and only son Jesus into the picture who came to this world 
lived a perfect and sinless life, died on the cross for the price of our sins, defeated death, hell, and the grave, and did what none of these leaders and judges could do on their own. Why we are not sitting where the remnant of judges was sitting years ago. We have a king, and his name is Jesus, and he is perfect, and he is powerful, and he is righteous, and he is the one way, the one truth, the one way to life, and he has showed us the way, and he is coming back. Revelation 17, 14 says, they will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them for he is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings and those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. This is our God, YA. This is who we are called to remember. This is who we are called to stand in remembrance with. Our job as the remnant of his people is to remember his goodness, to remember his faithfulness, to remember that he is truth. What his word says, what he tells us brings about life. And then in the face of catastrophe, in the face of change in a dark and hurting world, we don't have to turn to false gods, false teachers, a false culture that tells us that we need this to be happy and we need to move on to this and this will fulfill us and you need more and more of this and a culture that's constantly looking for what's next. There is no need to put our faith in whatever culture tells us is the next thing that we need to put our hope into. Listen, young adults, after Jesus came, like, his people weren't looking for the next Savior, right? Like, they weren't looking for the next Messiah. They stood in remembrance and stayed true to what Jesus has told them. They were the remnant of his people. And now thousands of years later, on a Thursday night, we're sitting in this room talking about Jesus because God used his people. God used the remnant. Why would you stand with me? Our, our role as the remnant young adults is to be a people whose faith does not look to culture, does not look to what is next, does not look to the world, but whose faith looks back and remembers the cross of Jesus Christ and remembers the empty tomb and puts our hope and our faith in that. We are called as a people set apart in community, a people of God. We are called to be a people of remembrance. We are the remnant. We are his plan. Like, let that encourage you. Let that drive you. Let that change how you respond to the culture around you, a culture that's constantly changing. Like, man, let it, let it change how, how you look at your life. Like, let it change when you're in a moment where you're hurting, you're anxious, you're worried, that you can stand and look back and say, man, God, God did this for me. Like, God healed me. Like, I was anxious and he brought me out. Like, I was lonely and he brought me comfort. Like, let that be where your faith lies. Let that be what you remember when the world is telling you to move on. And may, maybe you're in here tonight and you're like, God, I, man, I don't, I don't know this Jesus. Like, I can't, I can't, like, recall anything that he's done for me. Like, I, I don't know that I've ever seen him, like, show up in my life. Like, I don't, I don't know. Young adults, can I just tell you that, like, he did it all for you? Like, he did it all for you. The, Romans 5 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you. He died for me. He took that burden upon himself. So you, if you have anything to look tonight, like, let me tell you, like, man, he did it all. Like, he paid it all for you. With every eye closed and every head bowed, man, maybe that is you. Maybe you're in here and you're like, I don't, I don't know what is going on. Like, a friend invited me but there's like something stirring in my heart right now. And this, this Jesus, like, man, I want that. Like, I want something else to put my hope in. Like, I want something else besides this world because nothing is fulfilling me. Nothing is, is bringing me life. Like, I need something else. And you, you want to know more about this Jesus. You want to start a relationship with Jesus would you do me a favor? Would you just slip up your hand? Amen. Amen. To you. Lord, we thank you so much, God, 
Lord, we thank you so much that in the face of a world that is broken, that is hurting, that is constantly looking for more, something else to fulfill them, something else to put their hope in, God, we thank you that you are our hope, that you are an unwavering hope, that the cross of Jesus Christ stands today, Jesus, and that we can be a people of remembrance, God. Lord, I thank you for this room. I thank you for the call you have on this group of people, God. Lord, I believe that this generation, Lord, that this remnant of your church is called to be a people to, that will stand in faith, that will stand in remembrance. And years later, we will see the fruit of the people who remain faithful, God, the fruit of the people who stood in remembrance of you, Lord. God, you've done it all. Lord, we're so grateful. We love you so much, and it is our honor to worship you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Bye. Love you.